Welcome back, Shalliners. Well, today, in honor of Frozen 2 hitting the theaters, and if you guys are moms and you're watching this, I'm sure your entire existence is funneled down to finding the perfect Elsa costume for your four-year-old or whatever to wear to the theater. I do not envy you. But in honor of Frozen returning, we're going to talk about Kristen Bell and her marriage to Dax Shepard. And for once, because I know you guys have been asking about couples we love instead of just couples we hate, we're going to talk about why this relationship works, what we can learn from it in a good way. Because I think Kristen and Dax are one of the rare Hollywood and like just general life examples of two people with high powered careers, high powered lives who managed to make it work and seemingly like get stronger and love each other more. What a concept. But first, just want to remind you guys, if you want to talk to me one-on-one -on -one about anything that's going on, please don't make it Frozen related because I've never seen it. I never have heard Let It Go and I never want to, okay? Find me on my website, shallonlester.com, where you can take some fun quizzes about how your social media stacks up and what kind of vibe it gets. You can also shop my new merchandise collection and binge watch some videos. Oh yeah, and also <laughs> follow me on Instagram at ShallonXO where I let you vote on the next video topic. This is one of the big ones you guys have been suggesting. And listen to my podcast, Girl on Top, out every Wednesday, every place podcasts are found. So, uh, because I'm lazy, this website had kind of like aggregated all of Kristen Bell's um, marriage advice that she's given over the years because she gives a lot. Like she talks very, very openly about her marriage, about how they go to therapy. Dax is an alcoholic and he goes to AA meetings and he's very upfront even with his children. They have two little girls. I think it's like seven and five probably. They're about that. Lincoln and Delta. I like the name Lincoln. Delta, it's an airline. You know, it's an airline. It's, I'm not going to name my kid Lufthansa. That's kind of a doper name or virgin. <laughs> I want to ruin her life. I want to ruin her high school years just right out the gate. Virgin Atlantic coming out the womb. Anyway, so he even tells the daughters like daddy has to go to a meeting right now and this is why daddy doesn't drink and blah, blah, blah. And he's struggling with things. There's something to be said for kind of insulating children. But you know what? I feel like that's what society has been doing. How's it working out? We grew up with a lot of like weird concepts about what a relationship entails that everything should be perfect the behind the scenes like why are mom and dad fighting why are they talking about heavy things maybe Kristen and Dax have found the secret formula and it involves a lot of honesty so these two started dating in 2007 they got married in 2013 so they've been together a really really long time like that's that's a long ass time so I'm gonna go through this article and some of the advice I think is good some of it is like not my favorite, but we'll break it down. But this is kind of the secret sauce to Kristen and Dax's relationship because you know what's difficult? The fact that she is so much more successful. Also, can we talk about how this girl is 40 years old? She, Kristen Bell is 40 years old. And you know what? You know what? This goes to show that aging is like a fantasy. You can look as good at 28 as you do at 40. It is about staying out of the sun and not overstuffing yourself with fillers, you know, to try to correct your sun soaked years. Don't smoke. Okay. Because here's the thing. Collagen is the thing that keeps you looking young, right? In your face. And Kristen has kind of like an angular face. She doesn't have like a chubby face necessarily. Like, um, yeah, she just doesn't have like that chubby baby face. So ostensibly she would not age all that well, but she has because she has preserved the collagen. Cigarettes, stress, and smoking ruins collagen, right? So you gotta stay away from those three things. And I think her crafting a healthy relationship with her partner probably helps cut down on a lot of stress. Think about how good you could look if you weren't obsessing about boys. Ellen DeGeneres is 60. That's how good you could look, right? Okay, so let's get to it. But yeah, like she's so much more successful than Dax. Like I truly don't know what he does. I'm sure he does something, whatever. But like she is the queen bee. She's the breadwinner. And that's difficult for a lot of relationships. Like, and it's not so much even difficult on the woman. It's difficult on a man's ego. They're hardwired to protect and provide. And you know what? They fucking should. We provide the babies. They can go out and bring home the bacon. I'm going to bring home my own bacon. I'm not going to share with you. Okay. I'm going to have my own checking account, but I will let you pay the rent. That's what I'm going to let you do. Okay. If I have a baby and ruin these nipples, you're paying the electric bill. But yet they make it work. And it's really, so these are some of the rules. Okay. One thing, never walk out during a fight. So she said like when their relationship first started, it was super toxic. And it was like, 
it was toxic in that youthful way where you're like, I want drama and I'm slamming the door. And finally, one day Dax was like, stop doing this shit. If we're having an argument, you sit your ass down and we're working it out. And this wasn't her thesis, but this is mine. Someone has to be the hero in a relationship, right? And let's, before we go any further, let's define what it is we're talking about, okay? Because I know you're sitting there, sat on a Saturday night, waiting for this fuckboy to text you, and you're like, yeah, I can't, I can't just abandon this relationship. You're not in a relationship. You're not in a relationship. You're in a situationship. You might be his girlfriend. He is not your boyfriend. Uh, I've been there. Obviously, I've been there. It's the, what this whole channel is about, my own mistakes, and what you guys can learn from them. But this advice that we're going to talk about in this video is for actual relationships, okay? Not situationships. Not, I'm hemorrhaging all of this, in, this love and, and attention and energy towards someone who is not giving anything back to me. So you got to be real with yourself because you can lie to your friends. You can lie to me. Don't lie to yourself about the writing that's on the wall because then you're going to take this advice and you're going to twist it to stay deeper entrenched in a dead end situation, right? If you don't think that he would read this advice or hear this and be like, yeah, okay, I'm going to listen to this too, then this is not a relationship. Dating isn't 50-50, it's 100-100. So ask yourself what percentage is on either side of that table. So yes, Dax realized what a lot of us do in healthy relationships. You got to be the hero. Someone has to step up and be like, I know that storming out feels good in that like drama immature way, but if we want to craft something that's real and legitimate, and if I care about you, and if, even if, if I, I only care about me and I want to be in a mature, healthy relationship, someone's got to step up and be that example. And it's got to be you or it's got to be, I mean, let it be you. Cause if, if your mindset is, well, it should be him. Okay. Then that is all the more reason why it needs to be you. Because that tells me you are actually the immature one. Because look, if you step up and be the hero and be like, we're not communicating like this anymore. We're not. Then you are going to get to see the writing on the wall about who he is. Because if he actually wants to keep going down this immature path and storming out in the drama, you're like, whoa, that's what this person is after in this relationship. They're not after a relationship. They're after like stimulation. They're after like this emotional fidget spinner. I'm after a partner, but now I see that they're not. And that's a crucial piece of data, right? They make space to focus on their individuality. I think this is so, so crucial. And so many questions I get from you guys. It's like, I've been dating my boyfriend for six months or a year, two years, six years. How do you keep that spark alive? How do you keep him invested? How do you keep him chasing you? How do you just like keep him in love with you? It seems like the answer is to just focus, 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 focus on him and your relationship. And it isn't. Not saying you need to ignore the relationship, but the answer is to focus on yourself. Interesting people have interests. They have interests. I dated Max for two years and he was always, always, always chasing me. Always like, liked me a little bit more. But because I was always really busy, I wasn't playing hard to get, I was hard to get. I had a lot of things going on. And if I had a goal, like, no, I have to bang out three videos today. You're not coming over. We're not going to dinner. I will see you on the weekend when I am free. And he's like, oh, you know, it kept him always kind of in this dating chase mode where he wanted to make sure when he did see me, the time was good. We had a fun date planned. It was quality time. We were communicating. It wasn't like, whatevs. You know, there was not a lot of like taking for granted. Or some. I'll do a video when I'm ready. I'll do a video when I'm ready. You better buckle the fuck up. So yes, having your own life is crucial. You gotta have something to talk about at the dinner table, right? I don't care how good your sexual chemistry is. Eventually, you gotta stop having sex, like for that time period in the day, and you gotta start doing other things. You gotta start cleaning up the house. You gotta have like something to talk about. Lust is not something that just I mean, yes, lust is its own sort of encapsulated thing, but having that withholding of your time creates more lust. I've said before, if you ask a woman, what's your definition of someone who is intellectually stimulating? We say, oh, well, he's funny and, um, you know, he's charming, he's well-read, he has stuff to say, but, right? It's like we all kind of think, no, 
a man's definition of a woman who's intellectually stimulating, she withholds her time. She withholds her time. That's it. So when we make ourselves too available, whether it's in a dating situation or a long-term situation, you lower that intellectual stimulation, you lower the lust, and then you lower the connectivity, right? And it's not like you should have this like false push and pull all the time in a long-term relationship. Who the fuck wants that? A relationship is supposed to be your emotional safe place. You're not supposed to be like, should I text him back? Like, bro, he's your fiance. Yeah. Like, but in lieu of doing that, which is what you do when you first start dating, you substitute in your own life. And again, it sounds counterintuitive that like to make a stable partnership work, you almost have to like turn away from it and cultivate this life on your own. But that actually is the secret, right? You need to feel whole and complete on your own. Cause like we said, dating isn't 50, 50, it's hundred, hundred. What makes you a hundred? Because it can't just be your partner. If it is, then he dumps you or things go belly up. He takes your whole identity with him right on out the door. He takes your goals. He takes your social circle. He takes your Saturday night, your Tuesday evening. Like it's, he takes it all. You are left with nothing. And on some level, you know that that will be the outcome. And therefore, you make very bad fear-based decisions while you're in that relationship. Okay, I don't, I don't care. Like, ugh. like you, we all know what it's like to make a fear-based decision, to dial down what we need just to hold on to somebody because we can't be alone because we haven't been giving attention to the other aspects of our life that make us whole and a warm-blooded animal inside. Right? Okay. Oh, this is a good one. They work on their emotional intelligence. What's emotional intelligence, right? Because we know what actual intelligence is. So an emotional, your emotional intelligence is essentially your toolbox of how you deal with problems. And hopefully here on in the Entourage, you are getting a lot more tools. You get better communicative tools and more importantly, you get tools about who you are. So Kristen said, she's like, it's not enough to, to leave a fight with, but that's just the way I am. She's like, know that everyone is doing the best they can with what they've got. So get a bigger emotional toolbox to fix your problems. This is so true. It's like, well, this is who I am. This is just, this is, if you don't like it, fuck you, then leave. You know what? There is certainly a time and a place for that mentality. Absolutely. If it's like your sexual boundaries, your financial boundaries, your bonds with your family and your friends, if they don't like it, they can fucking leave. But if it's like, well, I'm not gonna listen to what you have to say because meh. Like if it's about your communication skills, if it's about your behavior within this relationship, that shit don't fly. I mean, it can, but you know what you're gonna get? You're gonna get betas. You're gonna get weak-chinned, weak-willed beta males who are like, okay, they are going to be the ones doing that fear-based decision-making to hold on to you because they are weak, they don't have a life outside of you, and so they're gonna let you ride roughshod over their entire life because they can't be alone. I don't know about you, I don't wanna date someone like that. I am a strong alpha female and a strong alpha wants another strong alpha, you know? I admire someone who doesn't need me, who has their own, like, go play football, go to your German class, go do whatever you want. Like, yes, I want my time, I don't want a minion, I want an equal. So I'm not gonna tolerate that shit. So I try to have a big emotional toolbox so that I can look at problems in our relationship, I can adapt, modify, and overcome and that makes me more desirable to people with other high emotional intelligence. You know, like game attracts game. Like it's the same level. So look at the aspects where you're like, I'm not budging. It's like dieting, right? When I've tried to lose weight, it's like, well, I'm getting up and I'm having cereal. Why? But that, that's because that's what I have in the morning. How's that working, pudgy? It's not. That's why we're here. So if you're going into your relationships like, well, you know what? This is just how I communicate. I don't know. I don't know. This is just what I do. I have to, I have to leave in the middle of a fight. This is just how I am. But how's that going for you? How's that going for you? And ask your partner, hey, do you see me doing chronic things that you think are contributing negatively to our relationship? And you don't have to take it all as Bible. You don't have to take it all as Bible. But then cross-reference with your friends. Cross-reference with your sister, your mama, your daddy. And then see which ones kind of keep coming up and you're like, huh, okay. And then you can start to work on that. That's the tools you need to go get, right? You don't have to have every single tool, but ask yourself, what are you trying to build and what do you need to get there? If you're trying to build a relationship that has less jealousy, how are you contributing to that? 
Are you the one sitting home on a Saturday night doing nothing? So you're obsessing over where he is. Get your ass out of the house then, girl. Get some needlepoint. I'm needlepointing right now. So I don't sit around and focus on things and stock X's on Instagram. You know, look at your emotional toolbox and see what's missing. Oh, go to therapy. Go to therapy. We have a very healthy marriage, Kristen says, and we got here by doing therapy when we needed it and constantly doing fierce moral inventories. We both take responsibility when we are wrong. Therapy isn't something to be embarrassed about. There may be something that really hurt your feelings and you're scared to bring up. Go talk about it with a therapist who can mediate. You walk out of the room feeling like you're on the same team. That sentence right there about being on the same team, so true, so true. And you think it's gonna be the opposite. This is, this is what therapy, what people are afraid of with therapy. It's gonna pull you apart or the therapist is gonna take one person's side over the other. It's, again, peace or victory. It's not about who, you're right, it's wrong. What the fuck are you there for? Ostensibly to correct bad patterns and to craft a collaborative relationship. If you're not though, if you want to go see a therapist because you want someone to ream your boyfriend out for doing X, Y, and Z, just leave. Just leave. Just leave the relationship. You don't need someone to say that he sucks. You can say he sucks and move on. You don't have to pay someone $200 an hour. You don't need to do it. But if you're going to go to therapy, go in there with that collaborative standpoint, right? Because if you do, you really honestly do leave like feeling like you're on the same team. I've done couples therapy before. I go to individual therapy and you really have to go to both, you know, because you, you have to work on the issues that you're bringing into this relationship, not just with the partner, you know, because they're only reacting to what's happening. You have to change the thing they're reacting to. And usually you have to do that on your own. It's not scary. It's helpful. It's helpful. You know, if you're, if you're playing on a sports team, you know, you don't only scrimmage. You go to the gym and you work out on your own because you got to be a hundred, a hundred, right? We see that in other categories. And yet when it comes to our mind, our relationships, we're like, I can't do it. It's so weird. Weird to who? Small-minded people? It's not weird to me. And I guarantee you, I'm better than almost everyone you know. They treat their relationship like a job. People call relationships work. And Dax agrees with that. He says his, he and his wife put dates on the calendar and treat their marriage with the same respect that they would treat a work commitment. You have to take it seriously, he said, and take as seriously as you take your work commitments. It has to be scheduled. You have to prioritize it or it doesn't happen. This is true. And it's always seemed like unsexy. You know, when people like, we schedule sex, I was like, oh, cringy. I tried it with an ex and it actually works really, really well. You're right. It's a priority. And when something's a priority, when you have something on your calendar, you shape your life around it. When I have a party, I know I'm going to. Okay, well, I'm going to wash my hair at this time and I'm going to take my dress in my bag and blah, blah, blah. Like you plan for it. You get excited about it. And like sex, why not? Sex takes a lot of planning. Sometimes, you know, after you go to dinner, you just, you're so full. You don't want to be jostled. I don't want to be like shaken up like a bottle of soda. Like, ah, uh, just like leave me alone. And then like, that sucks. It's a day now you didn't have sex. Always have sex before you go to dinner. That's the golden rule. My friend Greer told me this. She's one of the few people I know who's happily married. So she's like, and then you have that nice flush at dinner because you're like, hmm. And then you can eat whatever you want. <laughs> like eat the fettuccine Alfredo. So yeah, if you feel like maybe life is getting in the way, school is getting in the way, the holidays are coming, they're busy, schedule things. Tuesdays, Thursdays, date night. First Sunday of the month, we take turns planning like a day out for each other. That's what we do. Because that also creates ritual. And ritual creates that closeness. It creates your own little microcosm in the world, right? That's why people have traditions. It's a tribal thing. Our tribe does this. And then it's this sense of community and this sense of closeness. So that's also going to really enrich your relationship. Oh, this is a good one. They cut out contempt. So... Contempt is like, ugh. it's, we know it. It's kind of like hard to define like irony, but you know what it is when you see it. Contempt is just, it's like disgust and it's hatred kind of, and it's belittling and diminishing. So a big way humans exhibit contempt is rolling their eyes. Ugh. It's like, I'm not this again. Ugh. I don't want to listen to what you have to say. 
So Kristen said this, if you have contempt for the other person, if you roll your eyes or you disregard something they said, your relationship will fail. You might as well get out of it now. We made a commitment, a verbal commitment and an active one to never have contempt for each other. So if I, so this is what Dak said, if I ever see you roll your eyes at me, said this to Kristen, <laughs> we need to hit pause and figure out what's going on. <sighs> These people are like two blonde beacons of light and truth. <sighs> I hope one day they, they do like, they should do a lecture circuit. You know, they should go around the country and do like workshops for people in relationships. Wouldn't that be great? I should do that too. And that's true. So contempt, like if you find yourself rolling your eyes at someone, a lot of times that means you're sick of hearing something. So pause and be like, why am I sick of hearing this? Because they say it all the time. Why do they say it all the time? Because either they don't feel like they're being heard, right? Like guys are like, you're nagging me. I'm like, if you would just do what I said the first time, I wouldn't have to fucking nag you. I don't like to nag. None of us like to nag. It's not a fun, sexy position to be in. And it does ruin your relationship. So, okay, either they're not being heard or I'm not being heard because I've answered whatever question this is that keeps coming up and that's what we need to address. Or I don't feel like what they're saying is valid. Pause and address that. Instead of rolling your eyes, just being like, you know what? I don't think it's valid the, I mean, it feels valid to you, but it doesn't feel real that you're, you think me going out to Applebee's with my friends means I'm cheating on you. And if you think I'm cheating on you, we need to look at where else in this relationship you're getting those data points because it's not Applebee's. And if it is, you let it go. Oh, let it go. Let it go. However that song goes. Hmm. Okay. Dax says he works to keep a sense of newness in the relationship, right? It's the last one we're going to cover. He gave this advice to an audience member on the Ellen show about how to keep intimacy alive in the relationship. So your lady, he said, your lady wants to know that you're still very interested in her as a human being, that there are still questions you haven't asked. Go to dinner and ask questions and spend time as if you just met this person at a bar. That's what's exciting, I think. And this goes back to what we were saying. You have to have your own individuality. You have to have your own life, right? And a lot of people like, I personally don't believe that love means being fully known. I don't want to be fully known to someone. If I feel, if, if I'm fully known, then it's like I'm, I'm boring. And then I feel like I have to almost like invent other sides of myself or keep myself so manically busy because like there's nothing left to discover. I don't want to fully know my partner either. Like not, not now, not after like two years or three years, like maybe after 70, like if you even want a relationship to last that long, maybe you don't, but this is true. You have to stay curious and a good way to stay curious is to be cultivate an, an environment of curiosity in all aspects of your life, right? If all you do is sit and Netflix binge and scroll Insta, of course, you're not going to think about interesting questions to ask your partner and vice versa. You're just not cultivating that curiosity mindset, okay? And how do you cultivate curiosity? You follow the threads of passion. Little things you're interested in, little things. I tell you guys this individually. Go back to your perfect nine-year-old day or 11 or a time in your life when you just felt really carefree. You weren't thinking about your weight yet. You weren't thinking about boys. You were just a kid. What did you do? Well, if you could have done anything on that perfect nine-year-old day, what would it have been? Baking? ice skating, looking at like dinosaur bones, bugs, playing like throwing a birthday party for your dog. It was something. Go back to that and follow those threads. Just, just see where they go. Spend an hour a week doing something like that and see what else it kicks up. That's going to stimulate your inner core of self-esteem, right? That's going to awaken other opportunities and other aspects of your life. And that's going to give you that individuality that you're going to bring into your relationship. You're going to spark that in them. They're going to feel energized. And suddenly you two got a lot to talk about at Applebee's. I hope this was helpful. I, it was helpful for me. Like I don't even have a boyfriend, but I'm like, I can't wait to get in a stable relationship and just, <laughs> and Kristen and Dax the fuck out of these two. I will do another video about cheating allegations, okay? Because it was just, it really is like its own separate topic. And 
So we're going to do maybe a topic like how to get over cheating, how to move past it. But like I said, I'll do that video when I'm ready. <laughs> Um, yeah, I hope you guys like this. Like I said, follow me on Instagram at ShallonXO. And if you have a question that you want to submit to me one-on-one -on -one and we can talk, find me on my website, ShallonLester.com and click get help. You can also shop my merch and take some fun quizzes and listen to my podcast, Girl on Top, every Wednesday.